Good evening, good evening, good evening. This is another Bible study session, and we are going on in Jesus' name. We're still looking at Proverbs and the instructions that the author is speaking through, God speaking through the author, King Solomon, and providing instructions for holy living. All right here, Lord. Waiting on you right here, Lord. Waiting on you. I can't do nothing till you come. I'm singing, Lord. Waiting on you. I'm singing, Lord. Waiting on you. I can't do nothing till you come. I can't do nothing till you come. I'm praying, Lord, waiting on you. I'm praying, Lord, waiting on you. I can't do nothing till you come. I'm right here, Lord, waiting on you. I'm right here, Lord, waiting on you. I can't do nothing till you come. I can't do nothing till you come. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we get impatient waiting on God because his time is not our time, but his time is perfect. So we just have to wait on him until he comes because he is an on-time God. Let us note for our scripture reading, I'll be reading from the first song, then I'll read the entire six verses, and it reads as follows. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his love does he meditate on day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chat which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Shall we pray? This evening, our find kind, gracious, and heavenly Father, it is once again that we assemble ourselves out to the house to study the out of their word. Kind Father, I thank you for giving us the mind and the opportunity and the method to come and worship you as we study to learn more about you and your ways so that we can better live an upright life, manifesting the righteousness of your son, Jesus Christ. Then, Father, I ask that you speak through me as I prepare to teach this lesson, giving understanding for the lesson as we are looking at uh, the second chapter of Proverbs, where he, the author is still giving wise instructions. Then Father, I ask that you open the, hear, the ears of all of the hearers and their hearts, that the lesson may permeate their soul. It is in Jesus' name that I pray this prayer. Amen and amen. Okay. Verse uh, chapter two of Proverbs, and we still uh, if we see this a continuation, not this continuation from one, but what I'm saying, it is a, a continuation of looking at when he says, "My son," and the a subtitle I could use for this is the reward of wisdom, and we will see as we go through this lesson that yes. When you get godly wisdom, wisdom, you will be, will be rewarded. And 
Uh, if you don't get godly wisdom, you're headed for destruction because without God's wisdom, knowledge, you won't and his, you won't be able to find your way. And I'm reminded of the Psalms uh, 119, 109, when it said the light, that word is the light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet, providing uh, clear directions on which way to go. So let us begin with verses one reading. And it says, and like I said again, and he's still speaking and addressing in his person, my son, if thou will receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. This is a clear instructional verse where he is pleading or in strongly encouraging or advising. And then let me kind of talk about my son peace from two perspectives, okay? If he's saying my son, and this was a discussion on last week's lesson, he will he, meaning King Solomon, who was the author, the writer of the Proverbs, and he is talking to his personal sons. Well, I kind of disagree because we had this discussion, good evening, in one of our lessons, uh, in, a, in one of my lessons when I was matriculating through Christian education, and that question came up. And he said, if he was talking to his personal sons, he was giving them instruction. And the instruction he is providing is applicable to not only the men throughout the old generation, but when he said, my son, that could represent humanity, good evening. Because we all have to be given instructions on how to live an upright life. Unless we hide the word of God in our hearts, we're going to go astray. And it gives rise for Satan to come in and uh, redirect our path. So when we look at it that way, if he says, does my son represent all of humanity? Because when we look at this, and uh, that meaning all of humanity, and he's encouraging us to listen. He said, if thou will receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, second verse, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understand. There is a popular phrase, but it's a true phrase. Get wisdom, get understanding. Yes, we can care wisdom. But if we don't have understanding, or if we lack the understanding, we will, will not know how to use the wisdom that we have. We will not get the knowledge that we, did, we, we deserve or we need. And this is what the author is, is pleading. And let me use the, term, the phrase humanity, because it's applicable to all of us, whether we are male or female. And my son is not uh, just isolated to, to the men. Yes, I'll say this. Men are the head of the house. And if they're going to live a godly life, so should their whole household. So they'll be not only witnessing to their, their offsprings uh, on how to live, as well as teaching them verbally. But with this has a powerful impact when they are teaching and in living it. Then the children will, will see their witness or their lifestyle in action, their godliness in action, okay? So that's what he wants, he's really telling them to do. And the third verse, he says this, yes, if you cry after knowledge and lift up their voice for understanding. For me, he says what? Now, if you seek after it, and when he says cry after it, you're gonna be really diligently uh, trying to get with him and to know and to know God, to grow in his love and his grace and his knowledge. But you will not do it if you are outside of the will of God and not trying to know God, nor even trying to understand his ways. And so he's talking to us, trying to give us directions and, and to impress upon us who are strongly encouraging 
seek after me, that cry for knowledge. And let me see if I can put it this way. And uh, K through 12, secular education. We are there to get basic knowledge that will help us live and function in society, not being an illiterate, but you can't read and can't write, and doesn't do, can't, don't know how to do math. Those are the basic uh, uh, principles of getting an education. And each year you build on uh, the knowledge you gain in the grade before, okay? Because what grade before, let me see it this way. What you learn in the first grade, you will build on that in the second grade and it keeps building uh, on each year's knowledge. When we take that and put it in a, a biblical walk or Christian education, what we learn as a beginner in Christ is laying the foundations for what we're going to learn as we grow in our spiritual knowledge and understanding. So yes, it's good to have knowledge, but it's even better to have understanding. Then he wants us to learn to know what he his commandments are. And our Ten Commandments gives us some step-by-step -step guidelines on how to live and in and, and, uh, and union with God and how to live in harmony with our fellow man. And so this he's and this he gives this proverb is called the book of wisdom, because it's all it is talking about on how to live and what not to do. And he makes it very plain to us, okay? Let me kind of move on. Okay, let me say this. Two things I wanna say. We are grow in the grace and, 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 and God's knowledge and grace if we study his word continuously. We can't, go into it, we should not put it that way, with, oh, okay, I got this, oh, I think I know this. We have to have an open mind to learn something new each time we study God's word. It, it is just amazing how Solomon wrote this, this, prop, this book of Proverbs many, many years before you and I and everybody was ever thought about. But everything he wrote in this book is applicable to our daily lives right now. And, and it also about every book in the Bible. This, the Bible was written many, many years ago, but what's in it applies to us. And when we can take God's word and apply it in our hearts and in our lives, because, and I can't, I didn't turn the light on because it's hot and I'm trying to keep them sweating that when we can have a hunger and a thirst for knowing God's word, hiding it in our hearts so that we will be able to do God's word and do it willingly, then we will have great success in life, not only in our physical life, but in our spiritual life, okay? Let me say this, let me keep walking on. Um, we might finish for chapter or two tonight, but if we don't, we don't. Okay. Uh, let me point out this. When we can hide God's word in our hearts and come out, commit ourselves to doing as God's as doing as God's word says, we will become victorious over sin. Now, you might ask the question, how so? Because one is because we are believers in Christ. Christ has already overcome the world when he went to the cross on Calvary. And when we have the, the indwelling, we have, not when, we, as we every believer have the indwelling Holy Spirit, who is God in the third person, living inside us, giving us the protection of, uh, the, the, the ability and the strength to do and live according to God's word. And let me say this to you. Sin is a powerful thing. We are no match for sin and Satan in our own strength. And I, I know this might sound repetition, but it's a fact. It is proven that when God is being all-knowing 
and he provided. Now, this is like his instructionals in this book that for us to abide by and live by, we will not fall into Satan's traps as we're going to see as we go throughout this lesson on what he points out to us, how we should not live and what we will do, what will happen, uh, what is the reward or the results from adhering to the instructions for this book. Okay. The other point I want to make out here if we can abide in them and I and, and, and us in his word, it brings in the focus. John 15 and 7, when it talks about the, the, the vine and the branch scenario. If we abide in Christ and he in us, we will be victorious. Because let, let me say it this way: God is not willing for any of his people to be lost. But he knows that some is going to reject Christ. And those of us who have already accepted Christ, we are saved. And he, he, we, he saved us for a purpose. And, and we have believed in his son, Jesus Christ, and accepted him as our personal savior. Now he's given us instruction as we are building our Christian walk. And then as I've used the school and the first grade, the kindergarten, and you're building on that knowledge and that wisdom and that love and that understanding each day. Okay, now, and then and we can keep on going that. Uh, listen, we, when we pray, we must have faith in our prayers and we are honest in our prayers. Then we are lining our prayers up with the will of God. Because God's will is going to be done. Okay. Let me say this. Yes, we pray, but there, there, that you I'm talking from verse three now. When it says, when we that with thy cry out after knowledge and lift up thy voice for understanding, when we pray and ask God to give us understanding, we must read our Bible. And ask God to give us the understanding of what he's saying to so we can rightly divide the words of truth when we go to tell somebody else about Christ. Okay. Now, let me see if I can say this. The more we come into the knowledge and the love of God, the more we we'll want to be in his, in his presence. Uh, and I don't mean that in a negative way that he's somewhere out of our presence because he's not. But what I'm trying to say is this, is that we'll all, we'll have that hunger to be in his, his presence through his word, studying his word and prayer. And it, you might say, are you saying I need to pray every all during the day? I'm not saying that either. But I'm saying that we must have and we should have a fervent prayer life. If we wake up in the morning on prayer, just thanking God for waking you up. And we go to bed at night praying, asking him, forgive you a good night's sleep, protecting you as you slumber and sleep all night long. Okay. Because as we see, if we're going to see in our lesson, and I need to hurry on because it's time to get away from me, that the evil man is always plotting to do some harm. And when we can walk in the righteousness of God, seeking his divine protection on us, he is faithful to give it to us. Okay, but can we just move on? It says now, if thou seeketh her, which her is in the minutes talking about God and his word, as civil and secrets for her, as a joy of a hidden treasure. The, 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 the son of Solomon, King Solomon, is, 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 is giving us a parable here. When, you know, people love silver. That's, that's our human nature. And he's saying, if you seek who? The knowledge and the understanding of God. It is. It's as if you're seeking silver and search for her, her hidden treasure. You know, there's some 
as I, I want to say this, a hidden treasure. And what is those hidden treasures? They are godly treasures of love. And I, I've said this, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of God and his wisdom, because we are seeking his wisdom, because our wisdom does not match up with God's wisdom. Okay, so this is what he's saying to us, that when we re can really seek and have that, that, that what the word, the adjective I want to use here to put for uh, constantly uh desiring to be in his presence let me put it this way see if i can make the point this clear and a love relationship when you're in love with your spouse your your yeah your other that you want to always want to communicate with the person you want to be just you, you text on them during the day just pick up the phone and call and say how are you doing everything's well that's the same way it is with our the love and desire to be in, in, in God's presence and his and studying and understanding and getting growing in his word because we are finding it in our hearts and it has become a part of our net very soul. Okay, let's just look at verse four. And he says, and if you do all these things, seek her as silver and search for as a hidden treasure. He said, listen, then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord. That fear is a reverence, the ultimate reverence for God, for who he is, the all-sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing God, and the all-wise God. And he said, listen, of the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. See, now that's what I've been saying on previous before I got to this verse. When we seek the knowledge, the love, grace of God. It is, it's, it is so rewarding that you have found a hidden treasure that you've been looking for. Okay. Is that am I making that clear? He said, listen, in verse six, he says this: for the Lord give his wisdom out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. So what are we seeking here? We're seeking God's wisdom and his understanding because we want to be right with God because we have, de have and is continuing to develop that love relationship with the almighty God. And, that, and I said just earlier about the, the, the human love affair with, one, with your significant other, how you always want to hear from him can't get enough of being in his or her uh, presence, you know, in her company. And you want to check on them or you call them during the day to see how they're doing or just to say, hi, all is well. Oh, he said, love you, babe, talk to you, you know. And then too, that can parlay over to our children. And, and uh, me and a friend of mine are just talking uh, just this morning that how in our generation, we did not let a week go by, at least a week go by, before we would call and check on our parents. But this, this younger generation, they think nothing, think nothing of it. Oh, she's all right. You can't take that for granted. It's your parents enjoy hearing from you, from her child, their children, just to know that, hey, they think enough for me to just to think and call and say, hello, mom. Hi, dad. How are you doing? Those are some simple things. Some easy thing to let mom and dad know, yes, I love you. I appreciate what you've done for you. And I'm thinking about you. Okay. All right. Okay. Let me, let me just move on to verse seven. Because he said, we, 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 Lord is willing to give us his wisdom. Out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. We need that because we need to know how to live a godly life in a sinful world. And when we are living godly in this sin darkened world, somebody is seeing and watching our lifestyle. And the, from our lifestyle, they can tell who we are and whose we are, okay? Now, let me say this. And he, when we see God's wisdom, he said, he laid up sound wisdom for the righteous. Whoa, 
You see how God takes care of his people. He wants us to have the wisdom of him. And he gives us that wisdom to make right decisions in everything we do in life. And we seek him in his wisdom, his knowledge, and getting understanding. Okay. And why he tells us this, he lays up sound wisdom for the righteous. That's up. And he said, for he is a buckler uh, to them that walk upright. When we look at, and he's, in other words, he's protecting you against all of those wickedness that we're going to encounter or Satan is throwing at us. A buckler is a form of protective shield. And when the, the fiery darts of Satan is thrown at us, that buckler is there to deflect it. Isn't that a, isn't, isn't that a loving God that he, he's all-knowing in the first place? He knew that his people was going to encounter a bunch of negativity and Satan attacks. But he said, okay, I want you to get my knowledge and my understanding, and I'm going to be there with you. Because when you have that knowledge and that understanding, it's going to be a buckler against you. And that is, this really kind of ties into Psalms 91, if I can get there. And I'm trying to read about Psalms 91 is a protection, is a psalm of protection. And when he says, and I'm not going to run all over the place because uh, he's not here tonight, Mr. Hey, Jager's telling me about I always be all over the place. No, I'm trying to tie in these scriptures for you. And his verse 91 and 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide on the shadow of the Almighty. Now listen, listen here. And verse 4, he says this. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wing shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler that his protective device for us. So, and <clears throat> in this psalm, he's telling us, as he's encouraging us, to get my word and hide it in your heart and let it become to the very meat of your soul because there's so many rewards from being in fellowship with me and having my wisdom, not your wisdom, but godly wisdom, and understand, okay, because he will be to protect them that walk upright. That's us as believers. And verse 8 assures us this. He said, he keeps the path of judgment and preserves the way of the saints. That's powerful. Powerful. He preserves. He shows us the way. And when we can walk in his way, then we be assured of, as I earlier said, being victorious because we are in Christ. Let me kind of move on. And he said this, then shall thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity. You every good path, you enjoy every good path. That is continuing to show, uh, impress, uh, encourage all of us. If you walk in God's way, there is so many blessings that will be bestowed upon you from doing so. Okay? You understand the righteousness of God. You understand what it means for us as believers to walk in uprightness according to his words and his instruction that he has set before us. Now that is godly wisdom. And he'll take care of it. Okay, moving on to verse 10. And then he says this. Look at this, verse 10. When wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasing unto thy soul. I, I, I inferred to that, inferred to that, when we can get wisdom and put it in our hearts and let it understanding of God's wisdom permeates our soul. What a blessing there is. 
what a blessing there is. Then in verse 10, he says this. Hmm. Let me finish this uh, before I go on. Um, let me go back to it. When wisdom enters into thine heart, it's not a head thing, but it's a heart thing. That's, and when we get all of that wisdom and understanding and let it just permeate our very soul, then we are the walking lit candles of Christ's righteousness. Because we, it will cause us to not only live right, talk right, as we will love our neighbors as ourselves. Yeah, all of them may not love you in return, but we never stop loving. And if they're sinful, you don't have to love the sin, but you love the person. Okay. And... <clears throat> It will cause us to do according to the scripture because that as the scriptures are holy scriptures, not just this, these the book of Proverbs or this this chapter in particular is all of the book of, uh, of the holy scripture is for our benefit. It is our instruction and in how to man for us to live whole. He made it sure. He God that we would and will be victorious and living an upright life. Okay. Listen here. We talked to verse 11. Discretion shall preserve thee. Understanding shall keep thee. We talked about discretion um, last week. And we determine that discretion is having good judgment and weighing out our actions before we act. And, and I believe I explained it this way, but if I didn't, I will. And we are trying to make a decision. We ask ourselves, what is the outcome if I make this decision? Or what is the consequences if I make that decision. It's a different, it's a, the judging right and wrong and making making our decision. We are encouraged to make wise decisions as opposed to making foolish decisions and acting like the world or the evil man, as, as the book talks about discretion. And when we can have that discretion and use that for discretion. It will do what? It will preserve us because it will keep us out of harm's way because we made a wise decision. I'm just saying what the book says here. And, he, and verse 12 tells us here what I just said. It said, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaks forward thing. And that was an evil thing. And it just tells us when we have that discretion and can, can weigh and ask ourselves, what is the outcome of my decision uh, if I do this? What is the outcome, uh, the consequence, if I do make a wrong decision? What is it? And when the bad outweighs the good, then you know that's not the right decision. And when we can find that the good is going to outweigh those, the negative, the positive outweigh the negative, then you do, you're making the right decision. And then if I can add this to it, we always ask for guidance from the Holy Spirit. And if we're unsure about it, ask, seek guidance from the Holy Spirit. He's, he lives within every believer to show us the way for us to walk in and, and make the right decision. Because God has no desire or no will or no motive for his people to do wrong or make wrong decisions. And I almost asked the question why, but it was going to come out wrong. Why do you think God gave the Holy Spirit to live in us, to help us and to guide us? He wouldn't have did that if he wanted us to make error. He did, wouldn't have done that. If he, Because he loves us too much if he wanted us to go astray. 
That's not his mode. That's not his desire. He, he loves us too much and he wants the best for us. He've already demonstrated his love when he gave his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. He done that. He demonstrated his love. You can't get, we can't get a better demonstration of his love. We can look no further than that. Okay. And he asked a rhetorical question here in verse 13 when he talks about how when we get discretion will preserve us and he will, and he will uh, understand and will keep us. And it says now, uh, and he, verse 12 will tell us about how he, what he's going to do for us. But verse 13, he really asked the question, who leads the path of uprightness to walk in the way of darkness? Who does that? Who does that? And what he's saying, if I can put it in my own words, only a foolish man would do that. Here I am walking in the righteousness of Christ and have a, 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 a powerful relation, a strong relationship with him. I have the Holy Spirit lives in, living inside of me, directing my path and, and causing me or teaching me to always trust God and, stand, and not lean on my own understanding, but at him and his, acknowledge him and his understanding and his wisdom. Then who does, who walk away from that to walk in darkness and follow after the ways of the of the unrighteous. Who does that? You know what? Satan is trying to get God's people to do just that. That's what he's trying to do. Uh, and then it asks, and I'm gonna finish that thought when I read this question, verse 14. He said, Who rejoice to do evil and delight in the forwardness of the wicked? For their ways are crooked and forward is their path. Listen, uh, listen, he, 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 he's telling us, he's asking those questions to get us to think, here I am walking in the righteousness of Christ. And I'm going to bow into Satan, uh, buy into his lies and fall away from uh, and try to sever my relationship with God. But you know what? <laughs> Satan is, is a lie. Because if one of us will fall in our walk, God is such a forgiving God. And he asks us just to repent. And he's willing to forgive us. But now, and let me look approach this question from another perspective here. Who is going to walk away from all of the blessings and the goodness that God has to walk out there and to turn away from that? Just throw it out the window and go walk after Satan and the evilness that's going on. When we know the wickedness and all of the negativity is short-lived. Let me say it this way. A person, uh, let me use the drug life, okay? Uh, as, a, as, as a parable to try to make my point. That's a fast life, but it is short-lived. you be either going to end up in jail or dead. So what is the reward for that? And what, what, where are we going to, where is that? Well, our soul going to spend in the hereafter. Do we ever stop to think about that? It goes back to that question on discretion and asking God for his discretion and understanding, seeking that, making those the right choices. So if I was getting into the drug bar and they listen to, so I'm saying, oh man, oh honey, you can make mon tons of money in this field. And you will be rich. You can have this big house. And that, that's just like Satan. He will, he will show you all of the beauty of this world. But then how are you going to get that? If you don't go about it the right way, it has no staying power. Whereas if you do things the right way, God's way, it will not only sustain you, 
God not saying you're not supposed to have a nice big house. He's not saying you're not supposed to have a nice big car. He's not saying that at all. But he, what he's saying is do it the right way. So that will be lasting. Okay. Now, let me say, he's 15. He tells them, who's, all of those people that are walking in darkness and are wickedness, their ways are crooked. And their forward is their path. And all of what he's saying is, yeah, evilness is their way that all that they think about. They're not trying to hear nothing about God. They're not trying to go get a job and do and write and, and, and earn a David's day's living. They were the rather steal from somebody else. They were the take this illicit drug and sell it to somebody, kill it not only uh, some innocent people as they're converting them. So this is the fast life. Our bodies is the temple of God. We are wonderfully, we meaning humanity, all of us, whether we are saved or unsaved. Our bodies is beautifully and wonderfully made. Regardless, we haven't seen anything else of God's creation as wonderfully made as human, as a human being. First of all, we got part of God in us because every breath we breathe is God's breath. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, and I'm trying to make a point that it will be real foolish for a person who is in Christ to backslide, call on God, ask the Holy Spirit to help us deflect Satan's wicked thoughts. And if he's looking at Satan as some big a character, but honey, he comes at us in so many different disguises. He comes at us through our children sometimes. He comes at us through our neighbors sometimes. It doesn't have to be a stranger because that's just how he works. Those closest to you, he could get through them. And that's why these, these lessons are so important that we need to stay in communion with God, leaning and depending on him, and adhering to the instructions in his word. Okay, let me say this as I try to try to move on. I only have a few more verses and a few more minutes, and I'm not trying to rush, but I'm just saying what I we just we have finished this verse, this this chapter uh, two. Now it says us. Uh, then it talks about these women, and I and and I want to really hone in on that. He said, now when we uh, when we walk in the righteousness of God, adhering to his word and his knowledge and his wisdom, it'll do what? It'll deliver us from the strange women, even from the strange with flatter with her words. Now, I know we all have heard about uh, talk about these strange women. Or uh, we can say the women's of the night or the ungodly women or those fast like women. And if we look into try to find out what is a godly woman, we don't need to go any further than Proverbs 30 and reading from out the virtuous woman uh, and ask yourself, who can find a virtuous woman? And it lays out, okay, yes. no, it's not 30, it's 31, Give, forgive me. I'm looking at it, verses 10 through uh, 31, it talks about the woman who is a godly woman. And he and he's telling them that you don't want to get hooked up with these strange women because they're not going to promote or help you to possible and the road that you are trying to travel unless it is a road of destruction. And it also speaks to, and let me give you an example out the scripture. Hosea married a woman, or is it in the Bible called a prostitute, and I saw a lady the other night. And what that was trying to demonstrate is that Hosea represented the godliness of our almighty God, who was faithful to his wife. And the wife represented the waywardness of humanity, who is out of Christ. 
Okay. Now, there is, they call them in the scripture, Jezebels. Those trained women that this verse is talking about. Now, let me say this way. So I got a couple examples in my mind, but I'll try and use one to make sense of that. When we, as Christian, and talking to these men now, right now, is that when you get hooked up with one of those fast women of the street, you are headed for destruction because you are unequally yoked. And it's, it's two to one whether you, she will come over to your way of living. I'm just saying. And let me see if I can use just this uh, scenario. But let me put it this way. When a marriage couple and the man will give in to the lustful eyes and desires of those women out there in the street. Number one, he's violating his marriage vows. And two, he is uh, not being faithful to his wife. But let me go back to Homer, uh, Hosea and Gomer. Hosea was faithful to his wife, regardless of what she did. Okay? God is faithful to us regardless of what we do, I'm saying. So if the husband is going to be unfaithful to his wife out there in the streets, because those women are out there, and it is getting worse each day in our society, where they see a man uh, trying to do right, and they will say, oh, they'll start lusting after him and they'll devise you that's being used by Satan, every scheme to get with him. And if he is not strong and rooted and grounded in the word of God and dedicated and committed himself to his marriage vow, he will fall. I've seen it happen too many times. And I probably, so many others on this line was, was, have seen it and witnessed it and may have even been a part of it. But I'm just saying that we must, and that's where that discretion comes in, because when he's being tempted, that he will say, no, this is going against my marriage vow and the fidelity of the faithfulness to my wife. Okay. Because if she ever finds out that he's been unfaithful to her, then she's got, they got to be that trust factor will have to come back into play. And, and once you betray a trust in a relationship, it's hard for the person who betrayed that trust to gain that trust back from the person whom they betrayed. It's hard. That's just, that's just how it is. Because any relationship is built on Faithfulness, trust, respect, and love. You know, it don't have to be this uh, sexual love, but a love comes in so many different languages. I love my daughter or my granddaughter. My, it's not a lustful love, but a love that a parent has for her, his or her child, or a friend, or that you can care, you want the best for them, and you want them to see them do well. That's the kind of love. And when any part of that relationship is broken, it's broken by mistrust, then you have ruined a relationship because we have somebody who the one who broke the relationship has somebody somehow uh, uh, listened to Satan and his uh, wickedness because he does not want either the God relationship or the relationship to the prosper. Uh, okay. Okay, where was I? Oh, and then notice he said that she, she, she flatters him with her words. They have put on all this big act of, I, I'm so much better, I can do so much better for you than your wife. Uh, and then knowing that they can't, but he's driven by lust. Okay, I, I, let me just move on. Oh, ho, ho. 
verse 17 says, which forsake the God of her youth and forget the covered covenant of her God. Okay. What I want to say about this is this, is that of her God. No, it didn't say the almighty God, because there's only one God. If you're serving a God that is telling you or leading you to lust after somebody else's husband who is not yours, then your God is the wicked God. And I'll leave it at that. Okay. And but but guess what? When I said that, and uh, when I use the analogy of those doing wrong, the short lived, because 18 said, for house, for house, incline it into death, and her path unto the dead. In other words, it's it's destructive and nature because of it is uh God speaks against lust. We are not supposed to do that. And see, her thing it is already dead. There is no growth there. Okay? All right. And he says this, whatever happened, 19. None that go into her returns again, neither take they hold of the path of life. So you are destroying life by getting involved with these women of the world. And he's telling us not to, for he said, thou that thou may walk in the way of good men and keep the path of the righteousness. These are some profound instructions that uh, the, the, the writer of Saul, Proverbs, King Solomon is given that is applicable now, just as it was then, and there will be for generations. Verse 21, and I'm almost finished. For the upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect shall remain in it. When you are walking in righteousness, you are be sure, you are assured of a righteous life and one of eternity in the presence of the Lord. But now let me tell you, verse 22 tells us what happened. This, uh, if, uh, that's, okay, that's why I read Psalms 1 talks about the ways of the righteous and the unrighteous. But 22 tells us this. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. God is going to move when he returns. He's going to take care of sin. We have that assured hope that God, when Christ returns, is going to defeat Satan once and for all. All that is going to be left when Satan returns is uh, a land of peace, one of love, and one of righteousness. Let me close with prayer. This ends our conclude our Bible study for tonight. Let me conclude with prayer. Father God, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for the hearers and the doers of this word. And Father, I come, I just say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you. I cannot thank you enough. And I thank you for giving us your indwelling spirit who lives in all of us, that we will live according to your word. We will seek your wisdom, not our wisdom, because your wisdom is supreme, and much better than our wisdom. It is in Jesus' name that I pray this prayer. Amen and amen. Amen. Amen.